Well, hello, everyone. Uh, this is Susan McGuire, and I am the Director of Professional Development at ACCE. Welcome to today's webinar on outsourcing your finance or human resources staff functions. Our own Lisa Birch of ACCE Benefits Team uh, will facilitate a panel of your peers to discuss the advantages, the pitfalls, and the lessons learned on how outsourcing can be an effective organizational management strategy. Before we begin, um, just a few housekeeping reminders. First, uh, at attendees are in listen-only mode during this webinar to avoid background noise. Um, we will be, you will be able to ask questions at the end of the webinar using the question function. Uh, second, to ask those questions, uh, just open the um, right-hand uh, question box on the lower right-hand corner of your screen, type in your question, and I will read the question to our panel. If we run out of time and don't get to your question, we will contact you. Um, you're also welcome to contact the presenters directly, and they will have their contact information uh, on the uh, last slide of the presentation. Um, and by the way, don't hesitate to type in your questions as you think of them. I will read them at the end, but if someone says something and you think of a question or something to share, go ahead and type it in. Um, third, the presentation slides are uploaded to the webinar panel. If you locate the um, box labeled handouts, you can click on that and download them. And then finally, this webinar is being recorded and it will be up on the ACCE website on our webinar page no later than Monday the 27th, hopefully earlier than that. So with that, I am going to turn the program over to Lisa, who will introduce our panel and get started. Lisa? Thank you, Susan. Hi, everybody. My name is Lisa Birch, and I am a member of the ACCE Benefits Team. It is my pleasure to have you all participating in the webinar this afternoon. And we have a fabulous panel of Chamber professionals who are going to share their experiences with outsourcing finance or HR at their chambers. So I'm going to begin by introducing our panelists. Um, I'm going to begin with Achilles Williams. Achilles is a native of New Orleans. He's the Chief Financial Officer for the Baton Rouge Area Chamber. He's responsible for the financial planning and financial record keeping of the organization. He attended Southern University where he earned a BS in accounting. And he's a member of the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants and the Louisiana Society of Certified Public Accountants. Thanks Achilles for joining us. Uh, next, I'm going to introduce Curtis Naden. He's the president of the Greater Topeka Chamber of Commerce in Topeka, Kansas. A Topeka native, Curtis came to the chamber in 2014 following a 20-year career as an attorney and lobbyist. He has helped engineer the creation of the Greater Topeka Partnership and the consolidation of multiple economic de development agencies, including the chamber, under the unified management structure of the new partnership. And finally, we have Elizabeth Cromwell. Um, since October of 2018, Elizabeth has been the president and CEO of the Charlottesville Chamber of Commerce after leading the Frederick County, Maryland Chamber of Commerce for four years. Her varied career includes marketing and public relations, corporate sponsorship and event management for several professional sports properties. So next I'm going to share a little bit of information about each chamber so that you can see some of their statistics, their membership size, and their staff size. And now we're just gonna jump right in. So Elizabeth, I'm gonna start with you. If you wouldn't mind, can you um, let us know why your chamber decided to outsource the finance function and just tell us how it works and how it, anything you wanna say about it. Sure, um, well, thank you for inviting me to join you today. Um, I have been with this chamber in Charlottesville for about uh, a year, or just over a year now. And I came from a chamber uh, that had a vice president of finance, um, a significantly larger staff. And so coming to a, a smaller organization um, that outsources quite a bit of uh, its day-to-day its -day work has been interesting for me. And I've had a, a good, um, I don't know, experience both ways, but I, I really like the fact that we have outsourced our finances and um, we have a uh, bookkeeper who works with me approximately a day and a half per week. Um, she has many other clients and she 
actually replaced uh, a bookkeeper who had been on staff previously. And I have to say uh, that was before my time, but I have been, I think, um, very happy with the work that our current bookkeeper is doing. She's frankly um, cleaned up some of the financials um, due to her deep experience. And you know, my, my recommendation, I'm glad to say, we're paying somebody a, a very high hourly rate. We're getting just about the best you can get, uh, but I don't have the un overhead of having a staff person. So she works with me about 10 hours a week uh, throughout the year, she works more when we are putting together the budget, the annual budget in the fall. She works significantly more when we are working on our audit, uh, usually in January and February. And uh, currently, I have her working uh, significantly more right now as well as we're doing some uh, projections for our current budget based on uh, some of the circumstances that are happening right now. But I love the flexibility of having somebody at an hourly rate who I know is performing at uh, the top of her game. And she has a lot of different kinds of clients, 501c6s, C3s, for-profits, foundations. And I think that breadth of experience um, actually ends up saving us some time because she has a deep understanding of her field. That's great. Achilles, you're next. Can you share with us um, what made you guys decide to outsource and how you found the company that you're using? Yes, yeah, so I started with the chamber uh, three years ago, and uh, this was the first company that I became involved with that had outsourced payroll. Every other company that I'd worked for uh, in my career had internal uh, people handling the payroll. So I didn't have any exposure to it. Uh, we use a company called HR Solutions, and they were here when I got here. And I have to tell you, I was uh, in favor of not even one way or the other. It didn't matter to me it, because all I'd ever seen was internal. Uh, but having seen it and how efficient it can be, I'm totally sold on outsourcing the payroll. Uh, it's neat. It's clean. I mean, we, can, we do it uh, twice a month on the 15th and the last day of the month. And within an hour, uh, we, we can have payroll done and the wire transfer done and, and totally funded. Uh, HR Solutions has hundreds of clients, so they're really efficient at it. And, and the beauty of it is, uh, you know, it may cost us, uh, the cost benefit is tremendous. It's about $1,500 a month. Uh, we have uh, over 30 employees and all of the information is organized with HR Solutions. I can call them and get anything from W-2s to uh, nine, the quarterly 941s, all of it is stored with them. Um, and we also have it on our computers also. Uh, but sometimes it's just quicker for them because they can just click a button and get information to me almost immediately. Um, and so I'm totally sold on the cost benefit of having it outsourced and just how organized it is and, and how much of a cost savings it is to do it um, and efficient. That sounds great. Thank you. Um, Curtis, you're next. Your story is a little different. So can you share with us your guys' experience with outsourcing? You bet. When I started with the chamber back in 2014, we had about 20 employees. And at that time, we were outsourcing our finances and our HR to two separate external firms. I think it made a lot of sense at that time for the reasons that you've just been hearing about in the context of HR, for example, it was a uh, important feature to have uh, top professionals that were looking over those sorts of issues and keeping our various HR files straight and helping us make sure that we were compliant in a variety of ways. And uh, you know, tapping into their expertise with also, without also adding on to our headcount overhead was the right investment uh, at that point. The same could be said of the financial uh, firm that we engaged to do our, um, you know, financial reporting and some of our, you know, our payroll processing, et cetera. At the time, having those professionals outside doing what they do best freed us up to do what we do best in serving our members. 
Uh, it also made ensured that we stayed in tune with best practices in those respective fields and stayed compliant. So when we were, you could say, smaller, uh, I think it made a great deal of sense. Now we have gone through a transition where we have brought together a number of organizations under one roof, under a unified management structure that we call the Greater Topeka Partnership. It includes uh, the Chamber, our Economic Development Group, our Visitors Bureau, and our downtown organization, as well as a number of other uh, kind of ancillary groups that fit under that umbrella. Our staff now is on the order of 40 to 45. Um, so somewhere along the line, we could tell that there was a ridge line that we were crossing over and that um, having an outside firm uh, take care of our HR questions, uh, we, we were starting to kind of uh, strip the gears on that a little bit. We weren't able to, we, the needs of a group of that size started to demand something a little more uh, immediate and and on site, if you will. So we have made the decision, we've brought on an HR manager uh, and she's got a great deal of experience. So she brings the expertise we had, it's just now that she's on our payroll and we benefit from having the, her with us day after day. And, and she's really able to stay tuned into the team in a way that I think the outside firm, even though they were top pros, you just really aren't able to do that when you're external. So our, our transition into a larger organization, I think uh, kind of helped make the decision for us as far as bringing some of that functionality back in house. That's very interesting. And that's kind of a good segue to the next question. So it sounds like you all have had successes. Um, and I was wondering if there were any pitfalls along the way or advice that you might share with our members to help them if they decided to go the same route. So um, Elizabeth, do you want to start? Um, sure, I would be happy to. Um, I, I have not had any pitfalls with this, but I can tell you anecdotally uh, a situation that I'm uh, familiar with where a company that did do outsourcing of their payroll um, unfortunately fell victim uh, along with a, a quite a few other businesses in this community of a payroll firm that did not uh, file the taxes, the state taxes that they said that they were filing. And so when uh, you know, the, the client, the customer was um, paying taxes to the payroll company. Um, it, they were unfortunately embezzling it. So I think um, one thing that I learned kind of on the sideline of that experience is uh, there, you know, obviously any, any good firm is going to give you the checks and balances where you're going to be assured that the money that is supposed to be going to the state or to the federal government is actually getting there. Um, but that's a, a pitfall that a lot of people learn the hard way just because of one bad apple. So um, that's just something I would, I would, you know, trust but verify. <laughs> sure. So, um, oh, I love that expression. So oversight is kind of an important thing to consider if you decide to outsource, there still needs to be communication and oversight is what I'm getting from that. Achilles, um, how about you? Any pitfalls, any um, bumps along the road? Anything you want to share? Sure, I, I, there's a potential pitfall and, I, and one of the things that, uh, that I learned er, early uh, once coming to the chamber is that employees, when they have questions about their benefits, or whether it's 401k, whether it's healthcare, they're more comfortable coming to someone that's at the organization and internally here. And so as the CFO, when, when people come to my office and have these types of questions, I jump on it immediately, uh, give them the attention that they deserve and try to get an answer for them. Because the, even though all of them have uh, access to a portal where they can look up their benefits, a lot of people aren't comfortable uh, tr trying to dig into that on their own. And so I would say a potential pitfall would be that the employees at the office don't necessarily have this connection, if you will, with the outsourced firm. 
And so as the chief financial officer, you've got to be there in the center to make sure that the, the employees are happy and they get their, their questions answered immediately because they're not comfortable going to an outside source. They want to walk down the hall and, and come and see you and, and get help from you and get the questions answered. So uh, a potential pitfall would be dropping all of that off to the HR firm and sending employees to the HR firm 100% of the time. And uh, you, you got to be careful to give the attention to the employees uh, because they're not comfortable uh, doing all of that research. Even though HR solutions can do it and can answer all those questions, they want someone who's at the office who, to help them and hold their hand and walk them through it. That makes a lot of sense. I can totally see how that would be true. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Curtis, you're next. Um, and especially since you have just taken back that HR function in-house again, anything mm -hmm. you want to share about that? I know that with it, this is kind of a tricky time and you've just recently done it. So do you want to share anything about that? Well, I would extend off what Achilles was driving at in that the external firm might be able to deliver in certain technical ways at a very high level. But what we lacked, despite their best efforts, was the type of attention on our team and our culture and our esprit de corps that I really think only somebody in your four walls is in a position to attend to. So um, that kind of trust level and that sense that there's somebody in the dugout with you who can help you with your questions and issues was something that I, I, I think would just not be what you'd find in an external type of relationship. I also um, would note that uh, we, we had had our relationship with, with our external provider for a great many years. And this would be true probably of any vendor relationship, but it would behoove the management of an organization to pay attention to that relationship so that it, 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 you don't become, you might say, beholden to that vendor. They don't be, it, it needs to stay uh, an, an appropriately formalized relationship. Um, otherwise you can, you can get into some straits as far as the, the role of the outside firm staying as an, as an outside firm. Um, and I also think that in terms of engaging an outside firm, there's always something of a risk. Now, Elizabeth alluded to this, but she's had a success with it, it uh, would be the, the problem of competing with the firm's other clients for their time. And it, it, it occasionally occurred that if we had a crunch issue, our, our provider might have also had other clients that were dealing with something and, and you, you have to you know, scrap a little bit to make sure that you're uh, getting the attention you need. And I, I'm not really trying to badmouth our old firm. I think that would be true of almost any vendor relationship. It's just inherent in hiring somebody outside. So on the flip side, um, you, you know, having our, our HR manager in-house with us enables her to focus like a laser on our culture and how our team is doing. Uh, and this latest crisis, has put her and us in a position to to do that that wouldn't have been regular business before. Uh, she's been calling all of our teammates basically every day and just asking them how they're doing, how they're coping with the crisis, how's their workload, et cetera, building relationships probably much more quickly than she would have otherwise. And I think building a trust level that is very solid there. Um, so I, you know, as far as we're concerned, it's, it's a great move for us and we're very glad to have that service in-house. Um, I haven't mentioned our financial outsourcing. May I take a second to touch upon that of too? Of so, course, absolutely. Okay. Well, the, what I would note is that again, our financial firm did, a, did great work for us before, but when we brought our organizations together, it was, quite a Frankenstein in terms of the different types of charts of accounts that came to the table and the different budgeting methodologies, the different different revenue streams. Um, and it, it turned out that trying to bring all that together into one comprehensible financial picture was really 
more than you could ask an outside firm to do, at least not for the retainer that we were paying them. It was necessary for us to bring on a, our own CFO who could grapple with some really complex sorts of intertwined accounting types of uh, questions. And it was also necessary to bring to onboard the ability to nimbly turn around our own financial reports because um, we went through a time right after our merger when we had four or five different boards needing monthly financial reports and the outside firm just I mean they're great folks they're top professionals they just it, it changed up the nature of our engagement with them and, and it stripped the gears on that too so having that capability in-house would prove to be uh, essential for us to be able to do the financial reporting that we need to do. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so Elizabeth, one thing that I was going to take from um, what you were saying earlier is that it sounds like it's really, if you're going to do this, it's important to find the right person. So for you, you found the right person. It's a really great relationship. So I would guess that when you're trying to, if you're deciding you're going to outsource, looking around and making sure you get exactly what you need from the firm or the person is a big important thing to do. Yeah, absolutely. And I would ask, I would ask around, you know, I would ask other uh, companies, there are, you know, other chamber members who also um, use the same person's services. And, you know, I, I think in this particular um, role, that top-notch references are critical. So that I would probably put more weight behind that than anything else. Okay, great. Um, so you guys have all touched on this just a little bit when you were talking, but we're going to, because COVID-19 is something not to be ignored right now, we're just going to talk for a minute about any impact it has had on you guys, on your chamber, or on whether outsourcing is even better because of COVID-19 or having, uh, in Curtis's case, maybe having an inside person is better because of this situation as well. So, Elizabeth, do you want to go first again? <laughs> sure. Well, um, you know, me being such a, uh, with a, such a small organization, um, I have to say I'm relieved um, that the, uh, the overhead issues, I mean, I think everybody right now is dealing with if not immediate cash flow issues some concerns about you know what your membership revenue is going to look like in the future or your trustee program if you have something like that and um in in my situation you know i think with most chambers your mo your largest expense is your people and so i you know, I, I look at out at some of the larger chambers out there that are making some really very difficult staffing decisions right now that I haven't had to make yet. Um, and I, I think in this case, I'm, I'm quite relieved that we are outsourcing, although, you know, that's something that we're all going to have to deal with. So, but yeah, I mean, Absolutely. I, I we're all dealing with the if you can't grow revenue right now, um, you've got to look at cutting expenses. And so I think we're all dealing with that. Right. Achilles, how about you? COVID-19 having any impact on you guys? You're muted, big guy. Um, maybe we lost Achilles, Tim. No, I'm here. Can you hear me now? There he is. Yep. Yeah, I was on mute. My, my fault. Um, what I was saying, <laughs> yes, uh, it has affected our organization. Everyone's working remotely. I am here at the office by myself. No one else is here. And really, the only reason I am here and not working remotely is because our annual audit is being performed right now. And when auditors do samples and, and tests, they, they need us to send information to them. So it was more convenient for me to be here and and try to get that done as quickly as possible. As it relates to our outsourcing of payroll, uh, there has been zero change in that. Um, when, when the payroll cycle comes on us, uh, I approve the payroll, send it over to them and do the same wire. And you know, since we, we closed the office, I think March 16th, so that's 
it's been a while now. We've had three payroll cycles since then, and it's it's been the same as it was before. We haven't had any issues with the uh, with the outsourcing of payroll. It, it has not uh, created new problems as it relates to the outsourcing. So we've been fortunate in that. Um, but uh, yeah, everybody's right. working remotely. So Achilles, going for, back to what you said earlier, if your employees have questions and they're, now they're working remotely, are they still contacting you or do have they now started going to the HR company for some of their nope. benefits questions? No, they, comp, they contact me directly and I encourage it uh, again, because I want them, you, you can, the HR solutions is a great resource for us, but we want to make sure that it stays a great resource. And if we've got employees who have questions, uh, they need to know that, you know, I am paying attention to it and I'm going to get them an answer. So they'll send me some information and I'll forward it to the uh, HR solutions if they can answer it and CC the employee. So that kind of gives that, that obligation, that connection so that the employee knows, okay, Achilles has responded and he CC'd me on the email and I should get an answer shortly. It, it's, a, it's a real feel good type of thing. So yes, they still contact me and, uh, and go through me to get you know, things done that they are not comfortable doing and, and we get it handled pretty quickly. That's great. Um, Curtis, you're next. COVID-19, anything yeah. to share on that? Well, I would say operationally, it has been relatively non-disruptive in the sense that, as Achilles noted, I mean, we haven't missed a paycheck yet. Uh, bills are getting paid. Uh, most We're all working from home, and thanks to technology like this, we haven't missed much. Um, I would just go ahead and embrace what Elizabeth was driving at. Our organization is one of those that had to make some heart-wrenching decisions about two weeks ago. We implemented a crisis compensation plan and we, uh, so everybody on the staff took a pay cut of one degree or another. Um, and we also were required to furlough some people. We had a number of open spots that have been put in abeyance. So, um, that's the story and we certainly aren't alone and we're not feeling sorry for ourselves. It was a very tough situation, but it's where we're at. Relevant to our HR person, it'd be interesting if she were here with me because her perspective might have a different type of hue to it. She, she had been with us about six days when all of this happened. And, um, in the midst of her efforts to try to get to know the team and really build up all that trust that I mentioned earlier, we launched into this stay at home model and then had to implement the crisis compensation plan. Uh, probably if, if we all had a terrible week, she had a, a worse week because we relied on her mm -hmm. to help us communicate some of that. What I would say is that having her in house though, um, was a real blessing from the company's point of view because we knew we had somebody who could sort of own the the matter of putting a communications system together, you know, putting the letters together correctly that spelled out how this was going to work and helping us walk through how to deliver some pretty punishing news to some to a pretty small staff. So my guess would be that she would say uh, it was a uh, fairly miserable, and I think it was, but we're awfully glad that she was with us to help us through that because if she hadn't been, it would have been that kind of reaching out to the third party and my my guess would be it, it uh, would have been much rockier. So hopefully that answers. Right. It does. Um, you guys have shared so much really, really great information. I can't thank you enough for participating on this panel. Um, Susan, do you want to let me know if, or do you want to take over and if we have any questions to see if they can get answers? Oh, absolutely. Um, let me see if I can uh, turn my webcam on again, just so you see, see me somewhere. Um, anyway, there, uh, there I am. So thank you, uh, Curtis, Elizabeth, and Achilles, and Lisa for your presentations. And folks, if you have questions, now's the time to um, type them in. 
um, as uh, Lisa has on her slide. Just type, open the question box, type, it, type your question in and click send. Um, I know our uh, presenters will be happy to answer anything you may have. Um, in the meantime, remember that this webinar is being recorded and I will uh, upload it to our webinar page um, on www.acce.org. Um, and that should be up uh, probably as soon as, late as, as as later today. So I don't see anything yet, Lisa. Um, I don't, yeah, I don't see any questions yet. One question I had was, um, do you, uh, can you elaborate any further on the types of vetting or um, investigations or research or how do you find these great people that you have um, or had working for you? Um, and anyone can hop in on that one. Well, from the standpoint of our situation in Topeka, it's not an enormous town. The universe of firms able to perform this type of service for us is finite and knowable and known. Uh, so I'm not sure there was a great deal of locating that was required. It was more a matter of uh, sorting through the players that we knew and and speaking to people on our boards and others to just get a sense of who operated at the at the level that we needed and um, kind of followed through from there. One little detail I, I hadn't given yet here yet is that even though we have our inside person, we do have a different firm retained at a much lower rate for her to make quick calls to if she has a, a question about something. So so we do have kind of an adjunct HR source. They're, they're not, we haven't outsourced the functionality to them, but so when we found them, we talked around and identified them as really smart people who could help us the way we needed. Okay. I have a question actually for Achilles. Do you require your vendor to be a member of the chamber? Yes. Good. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Well. Yeah. Even for yeah. Our, our events, uh, you know, we we hold several events throughout the course of the year, and all of our vendors are, are members. We we made that decision a couple of years ago. Same here. Hi, um, this is Lisa. Um, I have a couple. Of questions. Oh, okay. go ahead. <laughs> well, I had a question um, myself too. This is Lisa. My question is, so when you, the, the firms or the person that does your outsourcing, do they also communicate with your other vendors, like, uh, for example, your 401k provider or your health insurance provider, and it's all that communication, does it go well? Yes, yes, uh, they communicate with the 401k company, as you know, Lisa. Uh, you I do know. <laughs> you communicate with them quite a bit. Um, and Blue Cross Blue Shield, which is our health insurance, they also communicate with them. Uh, yes, they have a great, great, uh, you know, open uh, um, communication with each other and they, they work well together. That's great. Did, Susan, do you have a question? Oh, good. I, I do. If um, uh, I have a couple. Uh, the first is we use, we utilize a shared services model and we receive an allocation for time. Do you have any experience with that type of model? And I don't know what that type of model means, so I'm gonna leave it to you well, guys. <laughs> that's, that is the model that we have in Topeka. Um, and that's the way the partnership works. Everybody on our staff uh, on, on December 31st of 2017, they all worked for their respective companies. And on January 1 of 2018, they all worked for this new thing called the GTP. And that's what's at the top of everybody's paycheck. So uh, allocating the, the time of those people is a big part of that complexity that I mentioned earlier when I alluded to the fact that we needed to bring that in house. Another thing that makes it complicated is that a part of our revenue stream is 
public dollars that we receive for economic development and our bed tax, et cetera. So those obviously have to be accounted for in a, a way that is, um, you know, transparent to taxpayers, et cetera. So being able to map all that out and, and demonstrate clearly that portion of a person's salary, which was paid for out of which bucket of dollars has been really uh, a signature part of the the systems that we've tried to build in-house. I don't know that I've got any advice because um, it's, it's very complex and it's something that we, um, you know, pay attention to and I think kind of shine up every month as we go along. Okay. Um, another question is for outsourcing, how are you being charged per hour like professional services or by contract? And how did you arrive at the figure? Well, I can so, answer. I'm paying an hourly rate and I'm paying the hourly rate that I, when I started this job, uh, this person had already recently taken that role. And so I'm paying, um, a, and you know, she's, she's, the highest paid person in the building, but for the fewest amount of hours. And I think every penny is worth it. We paid a retainer for a monthly retainer for a certain scope of services. And then the contract clearly laid out certain things that were outside of that scope. And if we needed those services, an hourly charge kicked in. So we pay a flat rate per payroll. Um, and it's been steady and consistent ever since I've been here. Not sure what the, the model uh, was when they initially uh, signed the contract for it, uh, but it's for, from a cost benefit factor, it's, it's tremendously valuable to be able to do that um, and, and have all of that information organized uh, with the outsourced company for that cost, it, it's, a, it's a tremendous, tremendous cost benefit. Okay. And then um, one final question uh, from someone who signed on the um, webinar a few minutes late. Could you each go uh, review um, how large your organizations are in terms of staff, community, membership, or whatever, however you want to describe it? <laughs> we can start with you, Curtis. So our staff is, it's between 40 and 45 and my math's a little foggy because of those open positions I told you about that are sort of floating out there in space right now, thanks to the pandemic. So roughly 42 or so, a uh, little over a thousand members and a budget that's in the, um, I think 10 to 11 million range if last I looked. Elizabeth? Um, yeah, so we have a staff of uh, three, including myself, and then two contractors. Uh, one does uh, HR, finance, bookkeeping, payroll, uh, some membership stuff. She does a lot. Um, and then our other contractor does marketing, communications, and website. And um, we have about 700 members or so. We have another probably close to 500 affiliate members through other chambers in the region. So that's our size. Okay. In our size, we've, we've got about 33 and it goes up or down at any given moment with, with hiring and terminations, but we, we stay steady at about 33. Uh, we're the Baton Rouge area chamber, so we actually cover Baton Rouge and eight other parishes, what we call counties here in Louisiana parishes. Um, so we're a nine parish region and the Baton, the Baton Rouge area is about a quarter of a million people. But when you include all of the parishes, uh, we, we can easily serve over a half million, a half million people and we've got over 1500 members. Okay, well, terrific. Well. Thank you all so much. It was a pleasure to talk with all of you about this subject that I know nothing about, but I learned a lot. And thank you, Lisa, my good friend, for um, facilitating this for us. If you have any questions um, that you think of later um, or it's something that you'd like to chat with someone in more detail about, contact as if information is on the last slide. And you're also welcome to contact either Lisa or myself 
if you have any follow-up questions or you just need you have questions about resources that ACCE uh, may have about um, HR finance operations and so forth we actually have just um, developed a series of webinars and roundtables on finance and operations um, in in this COVID-19 period so uh, we hope to be a good resource for you and support for you all as you navigate this crisis so thank you again for ev everyone for your uh, your presentation and for your interest and uh, this webinar should be up on our page no later than Monday but hopefully sooner today or tomorrow and uh, I hope you all stay well and uh, we will see you on the next ACC webinar bye-bye thank you bye-bye